Awesome. Yeah, I can uh, fire it off with the first question here. We have a, a bunch of them rolling in, which is great. Um, the first one, which is an interesting subject. John, how do you see the technology applying to trademarking cultivars? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, crucial to it. So if I were looking at that and I was looking for plant variety protection, um, you need to show uniformity, true to type of your what you're claiming, and you need to show uniqueness. And this is an indisputable way to do both of those. And also to, if you, for instance, sell a plant on, maybe like under a royalty thing, um, it's a way to make sure that this can't be sold out the back door without you being able to detect that when it's out in the environment. So I think it's a, a crucial tool in doing that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another one, kind of on something you touched on in the start. Uh, what is a point mutation, and how is it how is it pro problematic in cannabis cultivation? So a point mutation is one class of mutation. It's generally a single nucleotide transition. Um, where they're damaging would be. Uh, let me give you a, a real obvious example. You you're growing a cannabis, and it's a it's a high THC variety. And if you get a point mutation right on the ATG start codon for the synthase gene for that, something that uh, changed the, the coding of that first critical amino acid that triggers the, the machinery to build a protein to do that job. Uh, the protein's not made and suddenly you don't make that enzyme and you know, yes, there should be two copies, but now you're, you're only gonna have one copy of that gene. So single point mutations can shut genes on and off. Uh, point mutations in a regulatory uh, uh, gene will grossly change or can grossly change overall expression levels of a whole row of other genes so they can have very wide ranging effects on phenotype. Having said that, the cannabis genome is, uh, as I said, about 900 megabases haploid and about one, you know, 1.8, 1.9 gigabases diploid. And, um, you know, a single point mutation most of the time is probably not going to do something. It's, but it's, you're worried about the ones that do hit these critical bits. And so essentially it's just just a small small change in the genome that and the idea is that you know if it happens in the point where you take a clone and then you grow that clone up into a bigger plant then it becomes a bigger you know proportion of the total plant right so that's a little bit different that's more of a founder effect and that's no reason to think that's a single point mutation that could be an inversion a deletion uh, an insertion uh, retrotranspose on things so point mutation is a specific type of mutation what you're talking about is more founder effect and what happens when you get a mutation at a spot in the plant so that's okay. a little bit different Thanks for differentiating. Carson, do you want to jump in with another? Yeah, yeah. On the note of mutations, and um, a question came here asking about somaclonal variation. So yeah. I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more on how we utilize this tool to monitor for somaclonal variation and ensure what we send out isn't uh, mutated in any way. Right. So what we do is uh, we routinely monitor plants that are in, in cultivation. So they, you know, they get tested right when they come in, we want to capture them right away. And then at regular intervals, we take a statistically relevant sample um, of that cultivar and we test them. And it's, uh, it's kind of boring on my end because I'll get 40 samples and most of the time 40 out of 40 is exactly the same genotype. And you, know, you sit there and you score these things, but that's what you want to see. If um, we detect, if mutations start occurring and over time, eventually a small percentage will start to get these, we start to detect those and uh, we run some mathematical tests and we can, you know, if, if this goes above a couple of percent, um, then we, we, we do is we go back, we take 100% verified true to type stuff and we reinitiate off that and then you get rid of the, the old variety. And it depends in different, or this happens in all organisms, um, generally about every two years in principle, you want to reinitiate from a hundred percent verified material to ensure that you stay, um, you know, 95%, 99% plus isogenic. Awesome. Awesome. So ba basically if we, if we spot a mutation, we're getting rid of that and then just multiplying from the isogenic material that we received. Correct. If, you know, if, as soon as we get something, it's called out. That's the idea. Or at least I report okay. it over, and I'm assuming somebody over there has a big axe or something. And... <laughs> that's it. That's it. And now you, you briefly touched. You touched on um, you know physically marking and tracking the samples. Now I know you're pretty good at it by now, but uh, how long does it take when you receive a sample to actually fully bring it to the VNTR process? Um, the routine workflow, assuming, you know, there isn't anything else in the way. So if I'm just sitting here idle and a sample comes in, it takes about five days total. 
um, because it has to go through a sessioning uh, into our into our database system. We do some checks. Um, there's actually, I won't go into all of it, but we have some error check mechanisms in the sample kit to make sure if somebody's taking a bunch of samples that they didn't give us sample data card A and sample B because that would screw everything up. And we have, so we check that everything, the serial numbers on the tubes and the cards match. And then we, you know, we enter it in the database and then it goes through a DNA uh, extraction protocol, which um, there's an overnight step. And then there's a several hour step the next day. And then we do the actual DNTR process and then it gets scored and then it gets analyzed. Um, occasionally, you know, 1%, 2% of samples, we have to go back and repeat something. We get, um, there's inhibitors and so we have to dilute the sample. Um, all told, generally we can do a, a turnaround's about five working days. We generally say five working days per group of 16 and an additional working day for each 16 in a batch, but it obviously depends on, on total workload and total flux in the lab at any given moment. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. On kind of a related note, um, how many, you know, related to throughput, how many tests have we, we processed to date? Uh, around 2,700 with the current version of the assay. And so before that, we had some, some earlier developmental versions of the assay. So and probably another four, so 3,000 ish total. And that's a mix of customer samples and internal kind of validation, QA, things like that. Right. Correct. A lot of it's internal uh, surveillance, um, these sort of things where, you know, I get 40 of the same thing. Um, but yeah, that, that's total number of tests that have been run. Awesome. And then how scalable is it then? Um, how many resources can you give me? <laughs> One of the things we are looking to do, and this isn't really a place to talk about it, but we are looking to do some things to increase throughput through automating some of the scoring right now, this is still something that's literally scored by eye, these eyes right here. And I'm very good at doing that, but I'm also kind of slow compared to a computer. And to make this something that's computer scorable involves some R&D and some changes. And as time allows, we're developing that and it looks very promising. So between some things to automate some of those steps, it's scalable, limited only by your willingness to throw money at the hardware. Um, we have realistically, um, we can do hundreds of samples, um, a week, so 800, 1,000 a month with what we have here, but give me money, I could make it 10 times that, I just need more space and more equipment. And kind of on a, on a related note to that, what other what other services does our um, does our kind of lab division offer? Do you guys run any other tests that, that might be kind of applicable or relevant here? Not externally, we do some pathogen testing, we do that internally um, where it's warranted, but right now none of that's done externally. We've also done, we have dabbled in whole genome sequencing um, and we've actually published a little bit on that. And there's certainly some very interesting things there. We've looked at some targeted panels of just genes on the cannabinoid synthetic pathway to see what we could get out of that. And it's, uh, really interesting, but at the, at the moment, we don't really have the, uh, the time or resources to be chasing up on that. So that's kind of on hold at the moment. Definitely. And, and then kind of a, a follow-up question there was, has Segra published anything on this topic, but it sounds like we have and there's some... uh, it's all been at this point it's been um yeah posters or presentations at conferences we haven't published anything in a peer-reviewed journal we haven't had the <laughs> time I'm, I'm kept pretty busy just doing day-to-day -day stuff so we haven't done that the the general techniques are well understood in the in the industry and published there's there's hundreds of papers on cannabis vntr typing already fantastic this one's uh a little bit outside the cannabis realm, but uh, so does this technology pass over to mushrooms and how would it be useful there? So the technique we're using here is actually the method used for human clinical and forensic identification, if that helps give you an idea. The answer is VNTR identification can be done on essentially any species if there are suitable markers. Uh, the test we have is quite specific for cannabis. And by that, I mean, if we put a hops sample, hops is very closely related to cannabis. We put a hop sample in here, it doesn't work. We, we tried, it would have been nice to get what's known as a genetic outgroup. And most of the markers do not exist in hops and they simply don't amplify and we get, you know, we don't get data. The overall method would be applicable to fungi and mushrooms, but you would have to identify and develop those specific markers. And in general, uh, this is used for identifying individuals within a single variety. Um, within the fungus in particular, most work is done on 
uh, differentiating one subspecies from another, which is a sort of a higher level of, of differentiation. And that's usually done by sequencing, I think, the 28S uh, ITS internal transcript spacer 2 region or something called barcode or like BCOL. So uh, yes, but not directly. OK, awesome. Thanks. You know, uh, jumping back to one of your one of your examples from earlier in the presentation, um, one of the questions is about the frequency of mutations just from clonal propagation. Do we? I, I know you mentioned that um, kind of some examples of it. What do you have any any estimates or kind of guesses on the frequency? There? I wish I could give you an answer on that. You'd have to go back to our particular client. There, one out of fifty-five had it showed a very clear single marker. Out of out of twenty-four markers, one obviously varied. Um, I don't know how long, how many cycles of cutting that had been. Uh, what I can say is in, in tissue culture, it's about two years, but I think time is probably part of the equation because it's things like background radiation are where you get these mutations um, and chemical things like cytosine deamination, which isn't detected, uh, but it's also its number of passages. And so I think it's hard to say year to two year to uh, exceed two to three percent is a rough guess, but there's a lot of variables there. And conditions probably probably affect that. How much kind of background radiation? Uh, well, background radiation is one. Uh, other things, like I mentioned, cytosine deamination, that occurs normally. And there's cellular repair processes for that. Um, that occurs thousands of times per cell per day. And almost all of them are fixed. But the ones that aren't, if it happens to be in the wrong place, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and that occurs you know, regardless of background radiation. So there's a lot of different sources of mutation, which are an ongoing threat to cells. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, as for sending in uh, samples, can they be sent from outside of Canada? So we have a very detailed set of instructions about this. Um, you can send us samples from outside of Canada, but if they are crossing international borders, you, what you have to do is do DNA extraction on your end. And we, the, the little page that marketing people can give you uh, describes the three different ways you can send us stuff. So externally, you need to actually do a DNA extract. We tell you roughly what it needs. It doesn't have to be a, a really concentrated or really even a very clean one. One of the advantages of the BNTR method is that it works very well on dilute and dirty samples. It's extremely reliable. So international, you need to do DNA extraction. If you can't do that, I'm sure you can find a local university um, or biotech company, which for a couple of dollars will do it for you. Perfect. Thanks. Awesome. And we have, I should say, we have done that. We've done that for a couple of U.S. customers. They've, they've sent us DNA. Um, it's actually easier for me because then I don't have to do the DNA extraction step. The But does put the onus on them of making sure they properly label tube A, sample A. If, if they get that wrong, I, I would never know the difference, right? Yeah, exactly. Kind of combining a couple of questions about a proprietary genetic data and into one. Um, can you kind of yep. recap how how certain DNA tests might expose some of that information? Um, you know, if a customer is to send a cultivar in, and then how how the BNTR kind of avoids, you know, or doesn't capture any of that information. So that's a that's actually a very long convoluted answer. Unfortunately, if you want to understand why, but I'll try to explain it this way. Um, the method, VNTR uses a very small number of points in the genome. So 10 or 12, depending on the version right now, 12 points uh, times two, because there's two copies. Of each one. So 24 specific spots in the genome, but each of those spots can have a very large amount of diversity. So it's 24 times this, this very large number, you know, each of those can have 10, 12, 14 different versions there. And that's what gives us this very high probability of identity. But you're only looking at this very small number of places in the genome. So most of the genes that are of interest to anybody are nowhere physically near that. And during um, recombination, when genes reassort between chromosomes, they're a long ways away. And so they're no longer linked. So they're not what's called a linked trait. So we're only looking at a small number of spots in the genome and they're nowhere near any genes of interest. Things like SNP, on the other hand, use a massive number of spots across the genome 2,000, 3,000 are kind of reasonable numbers there. Um, and each of those spots has very low diversity. It has maybe like two choices. And that's how they get, they, they multiply number of spots by number of varieties. And that's how they get up into the same sort of total number of genotypes they can detect. But now, because you have these, these uh, multiple tags scattered all over the genome, the likelihood of one of those tags being very close to a particular gene of interest serving as a marker, as we would say, for that gene, and co-associating with that gene as it reassociates during uh, breeding, 
uh, means that it's now linked. And so if you use a method like GBS or SNP, um, somebody with enough data can mine that and say, you have an extremely high probability of having the following traits based on these markers, whereas there's really no way to get that with VNTR. Awesome. And then, and then, you know, just kind of jumping back for a second to, to the um, frequency of mutations, we've had a couple more questions about kind of the, the rate and frequency in tissue culture. And just to kind of recap on what you said, it was, it was, you said probably about every two years is when you kind of start seeing that risk and when you need to reinitiate and, and double check. So, uh, you know, I'm not the tissue culture expert here, um, but I know Dr. Sabai at our guys that has told us that for other varieties, it's routine. Uh, somewhere between 12 and 24 months is kind of for pretty much anything in tissue culture for, for just for good practice, you want to reinitiate. And, you know, we have done the surveillance where I get all these repeat samples out of stuff and somewhere samples that have been in TC for around two years is where I'll start to see once in a while, oh, you know what, 1%, 2% of this stuff has one detectable, usually it's one detectable change out of 24. Um, you don't usually see more, but that's enough, like I say, to be a difference. And so yeah. that tells us that the, the rate in cannabis in TC appears to be about the same. And as long as we reinitiate every year to two years and we monitor for it, um, that's, uh, we can be confident that what's going out is the right thing. Awesome, awesome. We have one here, you know, about the specific linked trait. Um, and now, although minimal, um, what specific link trade information does a VNTR, VNTR disclose? None. Absolutely none. Awesome. And none that I'm aware of. <laughs> perfect. And, and is there any other labs offering this test? Uh, not that I'm aware of doing it commercially, but I mean, if you go in the literature, this is used for criminal, VNTR for cannabis uh, has been around for more than 10 years. Um, Australia, uh, criminal services uh, used it a lot, and in the U.S., different, um, again, usually state uh, forensic labs used it for legal purposes. Uh, Connecticut was, for some reason, a real hotbed of this and a hotbed of research, a couple of big people there, and um, this thesis uh, was somebody in the State Department of Justice, and it was funded, I think, by the Federal Department of Justice in the U.S., so um, it's done, but I think, as far as I know, we're the only people who do it to the industry as a useful tool, as opposed as a means of trying to put you in jail. Fair enough. Sounds good. And kind of related, is, is our test proprietary, or is it... Um... Well, the way we do it is proprietary. Um, the exact particular set of markers we use, how we analyze the data. Um, I've touched briefly on what we call a variety identity code, this 32 character string that we use things on like the genetic identity certificates. Um, that's, we're the only one who does that. It's an internal tool. Um, so if we had two different clients, they could, they could look at this with each other and it doesn't tell them anything about it. It just tells them if it's the same thing or not the same thing. Um, so the, the process is proprietary. The way we analyze the data is proprietary. Overall methods are pretty well understood, um, but you can only compare uh, results between the exact version of the assay. So if somebody else does a different version of this, um, we, we, you know, we can't really talk to them. What we would do is two different versions of the assay would tend to give you similar phylogenetic trees. They'll both agree on if something is similar they should both agree on if something is clonal, but I can't look at their data and look at my data and we can't mix and match those. They, it's, it's apples and oranges. Awesome. And, you know, you mentioned the DOJ in the previous question and uh, how it, VNTR is used in cannabis for more criminal orders, but, and you've also mentioned this for forensics. Um, how, what are the other applications for VNTR outside of the use that we use it for cannabis? Uh, the main, so the primary use for VNTR is commercially, at least, is in human forensics and human sample tracking. It is, uh, people may have heard of what's called the CODIS database. It's like every crime show wants to mumble, Morrow, oh, he's in the, he's in the CODIS database. Um, and that, I don't remember exactly what the acronym is, but it's the combined DNA database that uses a particular 16 marker human VNTR thing. Um, it's also used in often in cancer pathology labs, when you get samples from someone's tumor or possibly a tumor and you're trying to figure out, you know, what it is and you're looking at it in the microscope, um, labs don't like to tell you this, but there's sometimes a problem. You get bits floating around in the processing tank and you're not sure which patient they were from. 
and I got to go figure out where it was from. So it's used in the background there to confirm that this chunk of material over there was in fact out of the right person. Um, and it's used for anthropology. So it's really used a lot in human identification and it's used because it's extremely reliable. Uh, it works on very dirty samples. It works on very small amounts of samples and it's cheap and it's fast and the data is easy to process. Awesome, thank you. And then kind of related, how, how do you see this being applied, you know, over the next, let's say five or 10 years in cannabis, do you see it kind of ramping up? You know, what, what areas do you see really kind of taking off because of the NPR or improving <sighs> the NPR? I don't know if I see it here, but I'll tell you what I would dream of seeing it as. If you go out and get grapes or you buy a, you know, a prize winning, you know, a dog from a, from a major breeder, anything like this, variety names have very particular meanings. And it'd be great if, cannabis was the same that if you went to get an og kush you actually knew it was an og kush you know I, I pointed to something on the phylogenetic tree where i think we had it you know 19 names on one particular clone it's a real it must grow really well uh it must be popular but it's called we've seen it called 19 different things it's the same thing um vntr because of its identity power and its non-disclosure of linked traits i think would be a very good method for industries in this space to agree on as to choose a method um, choose VNTR as a method and choose a particular panel and analysis approach to that to have a shared way to identify um, type specimens as basis of varieties and just like you know Dalmatians aren't clones within cannabis you might have multiple things that are not exactly clonal that you still want to call OG Kush and that in my opinion would be based on three things uh, be based on the DNA relatedness by VNTR being very close within a certain, there's a certain allowable amount of variation. Again, they're not clones, right? So there's a certain amount of genetic variation allowable. Uh, and within that, I think you would also probably want to say specifically THC and CBD levels and the ratio of those levels. And then I think probably the third attribute would be overall um, terpene and, and cannabinoid profile to a, an experiential perspective. And that's a, that's a clumsy way of saying it, but there's a, there is a researcher who specializes in this. And I think you'd wanna say that a variety has to match the type specimen plus or minus a little tiny bit of variation around all three of those. And I think the VNTR would be kind of the underpinning of that. And so now if you did this, you could have like a international agreement that this is an OG Kush and that's a, a Girl Scout cookie. You know, we've seen, I think we have seven different things that have been called Girl Scout cookies. I don't know which one's the right one, but I'll tell you, they're not all Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> um, so that's, I, I think, where ideally it could go in this industry and I think would do a lot towards brand protection, variety identity. Um, it would protect breeders' rights and it would make customers uh, know that they're getting reliably the right thing that they want every time. Fantastic. And, you know, I, I guess kind of just to, to probably do one last question that a couple of people have asked about, you know, the, the, um, and stepping back and looking at where, where we are now in the industry, can you share a little bit of, of the results from that supply chain analysis that you mentioned where we, you know, we took a bunch of market samples and, and tested them. You kind of alluded to it there, but it, it sounds like there's a pretty good amount of variation among reported names out there. Well, reported names are all over the place. Yeah. Um, I, and you know, interestingly enough, if you pick a less common variety name, um, we tend to see those all tend to be very genetically, very close. Um, and I think it's because, you know, it's not a real high, high value sample. It's not really widely spread. So there's both little reason for intentional mislabeling, which may be one source of error. And there's also, because it's less widely spread, there's less chance for accidental mislabeling because that occurs, you know, once every X many samples. And if there's a lot less samples, it doesn't happen as often. So, um, but if you pick the really popular name, Sour Diesel, for example, is uh, more than 2% of all cannabis for sale that we, we did an analysis a couple of years ago. Um, you pick these really common names and grower one versus grower two versus grower three, we may find that a couple of them have something that is very close to each other. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing, but at least, at least they agree on the name. And then you'll have somebody else that's out there. And then we have these examples, like I say, of one particular clone, which we've seen multiple names and with, there are a couple of examples of that that one is really specifically there are several LPs in Canada selling out under wildly different names the lot to lot variation uh, generally not too bad we've 
I can think of one particular case where one LP, two different lots um, were not the same material, but most of the time when we've looked at that, they are the same material or at least very, very close to kind of thing where I'd say, you know, these are so genetically close that I, I could believe, you know, these are two very closely related mothers and I'll let it pass. I would accept they're probably the same thing. Um, and that thing where within one bottle, one one gram sample, is it multiple things? We've seen that twice. Those are both from a single LP. Um, again, I'm not going to say names here, but it suggests that that's their production practice and they probably know very well that they're doing that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, yeah, it looks like we're running up on time, but uh, thank you, John, for letting us and through us, the audience, uh, pick your brain through the Q&A period and giving us a great presentation. Um, for everybody in the audience here, if you want more information or if there's anything that we didn't cover, uh, we will be circulating a recording of this um, and you can always reach out to us through the info at segra.com. Um, we'll get back to you or confer with uh, Dr. John Brunstein and, and get the correct answer over to you. So uh, thanks everybody and appreciate your time. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys.